you that I don't know, welcome. My name is Erin Brown. I work as program director for the Ignatian Solidarity Network. Um, we have been gathering, gosh, maybe for a year and a half now, um, as parishes and parishioners from across the country to have conversations about racial justice and about what work for racial justice within our own parish communities look like. So um, again, if you're new to the group, welcome. If you're returning, welcome to you as well. We're glad that you're back. Um, today we are joined by um, Damien and Eric, and we'll have another Eric join us later on, um, presenting about a retreat that they planned focused on racial justice. So I'm actually gonna hand it over to them um, to provide a little bit more context um, from the group that they were working with and that they'll share with you um, their, their retreat. And we will have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to um, keep your questions, write them in the chat or um, keep them to, to vocalize when, we're, when we reach the end. So without further ado, Damien and Eric. Thank you, everybody, for for joining this um, this talk, this conversation. Um, my name is Damien, and I am a Jesuit um, in formation. I have one year before I am ordained a, a priest, um, and I'm currently studying at Boston College. Um, and um, I, we also have Eric Immel, who is with us, um, and there will be another Eric, Eric Stiles, and there they will introduce themselves. Um, and who they are a little bit later. Um, but right now, um, Aaron, if we could share, share the screen. So this, this conversation um, or this presentation is about um, kind of the, the development of a retreat uh, called uh, The God of Us All, uh, Praying with Black Spirituality. Um, so we're going to go through this, uh, but before we begin, I want to begin with, uh, with a prayer. Um, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a, it's more of a talk than a prayer, I would say. This is a, a conversation, uh, a presentation that was given by Sister Thea Bowman. Um, she was a, a, for those who may not know who she is, she was a Roman Catholic religious sister. She was a, a teacher, a scholar who made a major contribution to the ministry of the Catholic Church. She was an evangelist and assisted in the production of an African-American Catholic hymnal and was a popular speaker on faith and spirituality in her final years. Uh, she also helped found the National Black Sisters Conference to provide support for Black women in Catholic religious institutes. And in 2018, uh, she was designated a servant of God. Um, this is part of her address that she gave to the United States Bishops Conference in June of 1989. So this is a little less than five minutes, but um, I, it, I think it's a very beautiful way to begin this kind of presentation um, to hear from uh, to hear from Sister Thea Bowman and her experience of being Black and Catholic. Um, so Erin, uh, when you're ready. What does it mean to be black and Catholic? Catholic, it means that I come to my church fully functioning. That doesn't frighten you, do, does it? I come to my church fully functioning. I bring myself, my black self, all that I am, all that I have, all that I hope to become. I bring my whole history, my traditions, my experience, my culture, my African-American song and dance and gesture and movement and teaching and preaching and healing and responsibility as gift to the church. I bring a spirituality that our black American bishops told us, they just told us what everybody who knew knew, that spirituality is contemplative and biblical and holistic, bringing to religion a totality of mind, and imagination of memory, of feeling and passion and emotion and intensity, a faith that is embodied incarnate praise, a spirituality that knows how to find joy even in the time of sorrow, that steps out on faith, that leans on the Lord, a spirituality that is communal, that tries to walk and talk and work and pray and play together. Even with the vision, you know, when our vision is around, we want to be where we can find them, where we can reach out and touch them. 
where we can talk to them. Don't be too busy, y'all. A spirituality that in the middle of your mass or in the middle of your sermon just might have to shout out and say, Amen, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. that attempts to be spirit-filled. The old lady said, if you love the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole soul and your whole mind and all your strength, then you praise the Lord with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength and you don't bring him any feeble service. If you get enough fully functioning black church Catholics in your diocese, they gonna hold up the priest and they gonna hold up the bishop. We love our bishops, y'all. We love y'all, too. But see, these bishops are our own, ordained for the church universal, ordained for the service of God's people. But they ours. We raised them. They came from our community. And in a unique way, they can speak for us and to us. And that's what the church is talking about, indigenous leadership. The leaders are supposed to look like their folks. Ain't that what the church says? <laughs> to be class, black and Catholic means to realize that the work of the ordained ministers is not a threat to me, and I'm no threat to that. The work of the ordained minister, of the professional minister, is to enable the people of God to do the work of the church to feed us sacramentally, to enable us to preach and to teach. And I ain't necessarily talking about preaching in the pulpit. You know as well as I do that some of the best preaching does not go on in the pulpit. But as a Catholic Christian, I have a responsibility to preach and to teach, to worship and to praise. Black folk can't just come into church and depend on the priest and say, let father do it. And if father don't do right, then they walk out and they complain, you know, that liturgy didn't do anything for me. The question that we raise is, what did you do for the liturgy? And the church is calling us to be participatory and to be involved. The church is calling us to feed and to clothe and to shelter and to teach and your job to enable me, to enable God's people, black people, white people, brown people, all the people to do the work of the church in the modern world. So as we continue this, this presentation, we ask God to, to be with us. To, to help us hear, to listen, and to know um, the ways of our heart. Amen. Next slide, please, Aaron. So today we're gonna move into in, in four, in four, four movements, four acts, if you listen to <laughs> This American Life. We're going to talk about um, JARS, which is the Jesuit Anti-Racism Sodality. Um, that is the group that designed this retreat, a group that, um, that I am a part of, that Eric Immel is a part of. Um, and so I think it's important to know who that group is, um, because it was that group that um, realized this retreat. Um, then we're going to talk about a little bit about the, develop, the development of the retreat. Then, the, then a little bit about the retreat itself. The, the number two and three might be in, will be intermingled together. Um, and then um, Eric Immel and Eric Stiles uh, will be sharing reflections about their experience of the retreat, both as, as a planner. Um, Eric Immel was a planner of the retreat and, and a retreat minister. And then Eric Stiles, who was a spiritual director on the retreat as well. So we'll hear from them um, and their experience. Next slide, please. So the Jesuit anti-racism sodality was uh, created in 2016. Um, it was created in response to the signs of the times. Many Jesuits in formation recognized that the Society of Jesus um, was behind in its own understanding of race and racism. So they were, after advocating for um, uh, a conversation about racism, 
um, during an annual conference that the men in formation have, um, there was a move to create a group focused on the work of anti-racism. Um, and so the, 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 the group called, called ourselves JARS, the Jesuit Anti-Racism Sodality. Why do we call ourselves a sodality? Um, even though the Society of Jesus has had a connection to sodalities and confraternities throughout our history, the word sodality is not one we hear much today, actually. Um, uh, Ralph Winter says, another way of determining a usable definition of sodality is to look at the anthropological uses of the terms sodality and modality. Um, Winter says that modality is a church with a hierarchy and vertical structure that has people of all ages and stages of life who are involved in the life of the church at many levels. And some people are very committed while others due to life stages or circumstances or experiences um, choose to be nominally involved. On the other hand, sodalities are much more narrowly focused. They are usually very task and relationally focused where belonging to the community means deep and multiple commitments. It is almost impossible to be a nominal part of a sodality as sodalities define themselves by high commitment levels. So we found ourselves that we are a focused group. We are not interested in hierarchy and a vertical structure, but in community, in working together and understanding who we are as a humanity um, loved and loved by God and accompanied by Christ. Um, on this slide, we also have a picture of Pedro Arupe. He was the uh, father general, um, kind of the, the head of the Society of Jesus from 1965 to 1983. And what is significant about him um, is that in 1967, Father Arupe wrote a letter to the United States Jesuits called Interracial Apostolate, the Society of Jesus and Social Discrimination. And in that letter, he demanded that Jesuits adequately address racism in the Society of Jesus and outlined 10 directives that we could follow to accomplish the whole task of dismantling racism in our church and in this country. And he says, and I quote in one of his directives, in our sodality work, we should make special efforts to inspire our sodalists with apostolic zeal to break down the unchristian barriers of racial prejudice and discrimination and to undertake specific action programs to deepen their commitment and to increase their effectiveness in this apostolate. And it is with that that JARS moves forward with the work that we do. And the work that we have done has been very practical work, reading groups and webinars, um, civil rights pilgrimages in the South, conversations um, with other Jesuits about anti-racism. Um, in the first two stages, the first two years of our Jesuit formation is called the novitiate. And um, we have worked with the novitiate in St. Paul, Minnesota for them to do some anti-racism training with those men. Um, who are uh, discerning, um, taking vows with the Society of Jesus. We've also helped other JARS groups form around the country. And most recently, we started some JARS masses praying for an end to racism. But before those masses happened, we realized that we were not responding to the part of our mission that calls for focus on reflection and prayer. We were not inviting prayer into the work. Um, we were involved in learning and teaching and doing interior, you know, interior reflection about anti-racism, but where was God in all this? And we had been absent in that pursuit. So we decided to, to form a retreat. Next slide, please. So we began the development of, of this retreat. Um, by defining a purpose. And that purpose was to ask the question, why does this retreat exist? And what is the goal of, his, of its existence? We realized that what we did not want was um, a, a, a retreat that was like another workshop or another class. We wanted prayer to be involved. We wanted people to reflect with God um, who they are, where they are. Um, if this, if anti-racism anti work comes into the picture, great, um, but, but what if we invited people to play, to pray with a God that may not look like the God that they are used to looking at, um, to listen to music, uh, to listen to, to homilies, 
um, to listen to experiences that may not be in the same realm of the experiences and music and prayer that they, that they are used to? Um, how can we break open um, hearts so God can enter in in a very new way? Next slide, please. So once we kind of had that question with us, we thought, what is the scope of this retreat? So the scope of this retreat was, was the second phase of our development. We wanted to outline how this retreat will accomplish its purpose and the parameters it will undertake in the implementation and deployment of the retreat. Now, what's important to note is that um, the people the, who were part of this planning group um, were uh, Jesuits, so men. <laughs> Um, uh, the majority of which were white men. Um, myself, I believe, was the only non-white non person on the planning team. Um, and so doing this work required uh, all of us to acknowledge where we were at in our understanding and uh, level of comfort, perhaps, perhaps level of, of, of um, head knowledge and heart knowledge when it comes to Black spirituality, Black sacred music, when it comes to anti-racism work, when it comes to our own understanding of race. Um, so we had to hold that. We also had to hold the fact that on our planning team, there was um, no one who identified as Black. Um, something that we wanted to be sure that we did was to consult with people who would have experience in Black spirituality, experience with Black sacred music. Um, so that is what we decided to, to do. There is a group within the Society of Jesus called the Black Jesuits of Canada and the United States. And we, um, they became our advisors, our consultors. Something that we wanted to be sure that we did not do was to say to approach to approach these men and say we want to do a retreat what do we do um it is as someone as a person of color myself i know the feeling of when someone wants to know something about me and my skin color and then asking me uh can you tell me about what it is to be brown that's 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 a lot <laughs> that can sometimes be a little offensive um so we wanted to be sure that we did our own homework um and that if we had questions to ask, that we had resources and we had people behind us um, and in front of us who could help us answer those questions or point us in a direction, but not to do the work for us. Um, that was very important for us in, in, in the development of this retreat. The other scope um, besides Black spirituality and Black sacred music was also um, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Um, what, what united us, the planning team together, was that we were all Jesuits and we were all familiar with the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. Um, if you're unfamiliar with the exercises, it is a, it is a retreat that is done in four weeks, quote unquote. Um, they are four movements um, that St. Ignatius takes everyone through, uh, takes retreatants through, that helps them um, see themselves in relationship to Christ and Christ's mission. Um, and it is a series of prayers and reflections and meditations. So we, because we were familiar with that, we wanted to create a retreat that modeled that. So we decided, since we are familiar with that, we are familiar with an eight day retreat format, we developed an eight day retreat. We were also familiar with uh, retreats that are silent. So we wanted this retreat to be a silent retreat for eight days. Um, so in the, the, the designing of this retreat, we used the graces that Ignatius offers on the spiritual exercises for the graces of each day. Um, and that became the skeleton for this retreat. Um, and then we filled in, we filled in, the, we filled in everything else with, with everything else. Next slide, please. So the next move was to develop a retreat schedule. Uh, based on our experience of retreats, we asked ourselves, what would our ideal retreat look like? That was a very important question. If you were to go on a retreat, what would you want? What do you want to see? What kind of retreat do you like to have? And building off of our responses, a schedule and rhythm and structure emerged that offered a flow of individual and communal prayer that uh, we hoped would bring together the experience of Black spirituality, Black sacred music, and the Ignatian mode of individually directed retreats. Next slide, please.
as part of the schedule, uh, we wanted to include morning prayer and evening prayer. So morning prayer um, and evening prayer are the other hinges of the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, for those who are familiar with the Liturgy of the Hours, it's a series of prayers that one prays throughout the day. And um, if for those who uh, maybe aren't called to praying all the prayers to the day, morning and evening prayer are the, are, the, are the two pillars of the Liturgy of the Hours. And so we thought we would incorporate the morning prayer um, to open our day as a retreat community as we journey with Christ to deepen our understanding of Christ's work in the world, and in particular, through Black spirituality. And morning prayer was centered around a one or two spirituals or, or Black sacred music, which would enflesh and unfold the grace of the day, each day that had a grace. And morning prayer would also introduce a Black witness, and we'll talk more about what that, what, what the Black witness, what that meant for us, but that witness who would embody the grace of the day through their life and faith, to accompany our prayer throughout the day. And then evening prayer was the other, the other hinge of liturgy of the hours um, to close our day, um, to close our day in prayer that we have experienced together as a retreat community. Um, and it was centered around the witness of the day, featuring the same rituals as morning prayer. Um, and it was an opportunity for the retreat community to come together and allow the witnesses and spirituals to invite us deeper into the grace and our prayer from the day. Um, and it was also a way to, uh, to, to connect or reconnect with the witness for the day. And again, I'll, I'll speak more about the witness um, and, and how that played a significant role in our retreat. But um, we began with wanting to understand how does prayer work in this retreat? And we, we understood that morning and evening prayer would, would be a part of that. Next slide, please. We also wanted spirituals and Black sacred music to be uh, part of this, this retreat. Um, the music was suggested uh, uh, mostly by Father Joseph Brown, um, a Jesuit, uh, and, and these songs and music served as the frame of the retreat. Um, we had a, a wonderful person by the name of Cham uh, uh, Meyer Chambers, who was our music minister, who was able to provide us with spirituals and black sacred music that we sang throughout the retreat, morning and evening prayer at the masses um, to understand black spirituality is to know how deeply rooted it is in music and communal singing um, and communal prayer and music bringing that together. And, and um, we understood that to be a, a part of black spirituality and we wanted that to be a, a featured, a, something that was featured in our retreat which made the retreat not so silent all the time, which was great. We had, our, our chapel was filled with music and it was loud and it was joyous. Um, and then everyone would return to silence once we left the chapel. But in the chapel, that was a place for praise and worship and joy. Um, and because it was, and mostly because of the music that was there um, that we were able to sing out loud. Um, and they, these, these were the hymns that we sung during morning and evening prayer. And in the masses, they it, they were. We had a music book that we sang from, um, so that we could really engulf ourselves inside of this music. Uh, next slide, please. And and of course, central to all of this is the mass. Um, the Eucharistic meal is a sacrament of the body and blood of Christ and the sacrament of Christ's real present. And it was vital for us to center our retreat around the table of the word and the table of the sacrament as community in praise and thanksgiving, nourishing our journey. Um, the homily also served as a, an opportunity by the, by the, the, the celebrant, by the, the presider of the mass. Um, also, we also asked our spiritual directors to offer reflections um, during the mass as well, to bring together our day's witness and scripture and deepening our path forward towards the grace that we had invited everyone to break open as retreatants and as community. Um, we used the readings of the day for the masses um, and they were broken open so beautifully um, by those who preached. Um, and I should also note that, that, that the spiritual directors also preached during the morning and evening portions of the, well, the morning prayer of the mass of the day. Um, so we got a lot of a, a lot of reflection and a lot of um, breaking open of, of who we of who we were that in that moment and what we were doing in that day. Um, but the mass and homily again central to this to the day's retreat. 
Next slide, please. We also added, this was optional, but we were also added a group spiritual conversation. This is a photo of the, of the retreat, the retreatants and the spiritual directors um, who, were, who were there um, this past summer. Um, Black spirituality emphasizes community. And in the rhythm of our day, we continue moving inward individually and outward as community. So this optional group spiritual conversation was an invitation to share, discuss, and unpack the days of prayer that we were experiencing uniquely as individuals and who we are as part of a community. Um, and those conversations were so fruitful um, and it varied from day to day about how many were there. And sometimes they were the same people that were there, but to be able to, to talk about the prayer out loud, to know that, that, that prayer, um, our retreat was a, a community of prayer. Um, and it really continued to bring forth that, that emphasis that we were wanting, um, that we were, not only just in, we were not only individuals, but we were, sh we were in a community sharing in prayer. Um, and that it really helped embody uh, what this retreat was about. Next slide, please. And we have witnesses in the film. As I've spoken before, we had, we had witnesses uh, in, on our retreat. Um, each day, uh, and these were the witnesses that we selected, um, we were kind of, I, I would say in my own head, kind of like sponsor. There was a, a, a witness that, that accompanied us throughout the day. Uh, it was a unique move for us to, to ask ourselves who embodies, um, who lived out a life of, of faith, um, of hope. Um, and they did not necessarily have, to, they were not looking for, for Catholic, purely Catholic um, witnesses, um, but for people who we can look at and say, ah, that's what it looks like to be a, a person of God. Um, so each day was um, framed not only by, by, by music, um, but also by a witness. Um, and the witness, uh, we would show a film at the end of the day, again, this was optional, um, about the witness, mostly documentary, to, to again, break open who this person was. Why, why are we saying that, these, the, that this individual is someone that we want to accompany us on this day and later throughout the retreat? Um, it was a unique move for us again. Um, and the, the, the grace, it helped uh, solidify the grace offered for the day. And um, it was an opportunity for the end of the day, the film and the witness we hope that could become a valid and prayerful resource to enliven the imagination and the understanding and action in the ways retreatants engage their prayer throughout the retreat. Um, so th that, that's, how, that's what, how the witness played a huge role. Um, and it was, what was lovely about it was each day we had a, a photograph of the witness. So the witness was present in the morning prayer um, and then uh, the, and it remained um, at the altar um, or near the ambo actually um, throughout the day. And then um, when we would, at the end of the day, we would take the photograph and put it up behind the altar on the wall. Um, and so as the retreat would go on, the, 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 the witnesses would grow. Um, so they never left. They were always there reminding us of who they were and who we are as well. Next slide, please. So after all that, we have <laughs> this retreat schedule. Um, uh, this is what the retreat looks like. This is how it all ended up mapping out. Um, it felt, it feels like a lot, but uh, when we when, you, when we get to see it, this this is how how it looked. Um, uh, they had the arrival day and the departure day, um, but the days in between from June fifteenth to June twenty second of last summer, um, this was the rhythm. Um, they had the, with the optional spiritual conversations and the optional film documentary at the end of the day. But everything else, we 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 asked the retreatants to attend, um, to attend together. Um, lunch, the the meals were breakfast, lunch, and dinner were in silence. Um, but uh, morning prayer and evening prayer and mass were very very lively, um, and most everyone attended the film and documentary at the end of the day. Um, so it was a really beautiful communal um, communal experience. Next slide, please. Oh, maybe not that one. <laughs> um, oh, I guess there we are. Uh, so 
uh, that's the retreat. That, that's that's kind of how it how it happened. And I and I think um, uh, we're going to invite Eric Immel and, and Eric Stiles to um, first introduce themselves and then offer reflection. We can stop sharing the screen if you would like. Um, uh, to offer a reflection about their experience of this retreat. Um, so first I will uh, invite Eric Immel. Eric Immel was a person on the planning committee um, and a retreat minister on the retreat. Um, and so he'll speak about his experience of the retreat in light of those things. And then Eric Stiles will follow. Um, Eric Stiles was a spiritual director on the retreat and experienced the retreat um, in that particular capacity. And so his reflections about what the retreat was like. So we are. Thank you, Damien. I really, really appreciate it. I'm so grateful that so many of you are here. I've got to be honest, I'm feeling a deep nostalgia just seeing those images of the space that we were able to create on this beautiful retreat experience. Just a little bit about myself. I'm Eric Immel. I'm a third year theologian at Boston College. I was ordained a deacon in September of 2021. I'll be ordained a priest June 11th, 2022 in Milwaukee. So this Jesuit formation, some of you may know, is, is a long haul, but then it just sprints. So I'm pretty close to the end of this formation to ordination to the priesthood. Um, I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin, originally, which to my experience was a very homogenized place when I was growing up. I, I think it's not, it's not short to say that until I was probably six years old, I thought that every black man that I saw in Green Bay, Wisconsin played for the Green Bay Packers. And so I grew up in a white Catholic parish. I went to a white Catholic parochial school. There were very few black or African-American students at my high school. And my first experience, maybe rich experience of, of black Catholicism and black spirituality was as a college student at St. Louis University. Uh, so I, I had a long learning curve when it came to investing myself, my time, my energy into what we might call black spirituality or the spirituality of black communities. Um, and just a few thoughts about what it is to, to engage the work of planning a program like this. The first thing that I want you to know, and I think Damien and Eric Stiles could agree um, that this is all very adaptable. So I know that lots of you are coming from parish communities or spirituality centers, and it might seem like a lot to think about the logistics and the planning of an eight-day silent retreat in the Ignatian tradition. So one of my hopes for all of you today is that you see that even elements of this retreat experience, standing witness to the cloud of ancestors and witnesses within Black Catholic communities, and Black communities of faith. That's a good thing to do, and that can be done in parish and work communities and school environments in a lot of different ways. A commitment to Black sacred music can be done in a lot of different ways. Prayer and praying for the grace of racial solidarity and racial mercy, that can be done in a lot of different ways. So I hope that as you hear some of what we have to share about our planning and experience, you see it as an adaptable thing, that maybe some part of it is something that you can latch on to. I wanna say just a few things about what it meant to be part of the planning team for this retreat. Uh, the first thing is that it took a long time. It took a long time. And I don't wanna be discouraging to the idea that it's a great effort, but Damien, maybe you can confirm. I think we started talking about this in September of 2020 for right. a retreat that ended up happening in June of 2021. And we met bi-weekly. Part of why it took so long, as Damien said, is that we were faced with the interesting situation of being a group of Jesuits who were committed to providing an authentic witness to Black spirituality, um, while ourselves not identifying as Black people. We were a group of six. There were five white people and Damien, who self-identifies as a non-Black person of color. So we had this tension about experience and about agency and about voice. One of the things we were desperate not to do was make demands on the black Jesuits and our friends that are engaged as black Catholics in other ways, because you know, they get asked to do a lot. And uh, as Damien spoke to his own experience as a person of color, um, you know, 
as a white guy, I have to do that work on my own. And so we wanted to have something robust that we had conceived of on our own and engage a really robust experience of consultation with black Jesuits to make sure that we weren't missing the point. Um, so it was, it was a constant negotiation about what was good, what wasn't good. We were constantly confronting as a group our identity as non-black and really checking our assumptions, our stereotypes, our preferences. As Jesuits, we made an eight day silent retreat every year, which looked a particular way. Um, and so we had some sense of what it was to honor that kind of retreat experience, but also realizing pretty quickly on that this was gonna be a different kind of moment for us in our spiritual lives. You know, I think the other thing to, to name um, is that when we added this to our plates, uh, we were already very busy people. And I'm not exactly sure who I'm speaking with today, but I can imagine that y'all are busy people. And that if you have full-time jobs, uh, engaging in the creation of spirituality programs that are rooted in the black tradition may not be on that job description. And so another part of what we were negotiating all year is the fact that planning this retreat was maybe the ninth, 10th, or 11th thing on a list of many things to do. And so I found myself sometimes leaning back on, on the privilege that I enjoy and prioritizing this work in a lesser sense. And so one of my, one of my deep desires is that for all of you, you know, if you have a boss and you're interested in making this a part of your work, ask for explicit time, ask for a chunk, a percentage of the hours that you're supposed to be working each week to dedicate those hours to this work, to not make this an added thing because added things sometimes get pushed on the back burner. And if you are a boss and you would like to see this kind of programming and this kind of spiritual development in your parish, school, you know, center communities, give someone a chunk of time to focus explicitly on this. This is too important to put in a secondary or tertiary position. I faced that tension all year as we were planning. I just, I kept getting, letting other things get in the way. Um, and it wasn't until the retreat actually started unfolding that I realized how deeply important that this is. Maybe a couple of other things about my experience of the retreat itself. The Holy Spirit was, was guiding us. There were things that we just did not think of. For example, in the planning process, we thought, huh, maybe we should have a musician there. And then realizing how much of an effort it would be both to identify those musicians, to make that invitation, to find someone who was willing to commit a huge amount of time. Meyer Chambers is a good friend of mine. He and I worship at the same parish here. And he put together like a 90 page book of black sacred music which Eric Stiles, if you can see, is holding it up. Uh, this was no small task. And this was a task that only somebody like Meyer in his expertise could have done so beautifully. And so we recognize the spirit at work and the deep effort that other people put into this. Another sort of spirit moment, Timon Davis, another one of the directors came with one of the heaviest suitcases that I have ever lifted in my entire life. I said, Timon, what in God's name do you have in here? And she said one word, environment. And I said, well, what is, <laughs> what is that? And she started pulling out kente cloth and black statuary and framed images that, that created this chapel space, which Damien and I, God love us, we had not planned for. Damien, is that safe to say? We hadn't planned for any kind of environment. But the environment matters. And that's a part of what it is to worship in black communities of faith. So the spirit was at work. And one of the things that if you're looking to move forward on a project like this, that we would be happy to help you with is, listen, we didn't think about this at all. Uh, and so it's something for you all to think about. And maybe the third thing that I would offer, um, especially to white identifying folks in this group, um, there's no substitute for doing the work on your own. It, it requires a passion, it requires a willingness to read, it requires a willingness to be patient, it requires an effort of self-confrontation. There are essential texts that I think guided our work. One of the experiences I had in planning this thing was 
that another book would be mentioned or another resource. And I would find myself spending money that I did not have. I mean, I'm a Jesuit, right? Vow of poverty, no money. Come on. And I was just buying stuff because I needed to build up my own series of resources in order to, to do justice to the effort that we were trying to undertake. Um, and so there was study, there was prayer involved in every step of the planning process. Um, but to see it actually unfold, um, and you saw a picture of the people that made this retreat. Um, it was a diverse community of people. Um, but I think, I think we did manage to create a space that you know, in the spirit of the Institute for Black Catholic Studies at Xavier University, I think we created a space that was authentically Black and truly Catholic, which of course was the goal. And to our purposes as a Jesuit organization, as the Jesuit anti-racism sodality, we also, I think, integrated very well um, some of the gifts of Black spirituality and the gifts of the exercises. And so maybe I'll finish with just a few, a few key components of the spirituality that we practiced. First of all, as Damien said, it, it was an eight day silent retreat in the Ignatian tradition. We used the framework of the four weeks or four movements of the spiritual exercises. We spent time really articulating the graces that we sought and prayed for as a community. So it was, it was truly Ignatian, but it was also, at least to our experience and in consultation with black Jesuits especially, and with our retreat directors as the retreat unfolded, um, it embraced key elements of black spirituality. Um, the first week of the exercises was framed around this experience of wilderness, what Dolores Williams might call the wilderness spirituality of black Christianity, an invitation to go out into the wilderness and then to come back from that wilderness. Black sacred music was essential. Uh, someone was jokingly saying to me just the other day that this was the loudest silent retreat that they had ever made because Meyer Chambers was making a joyful noise and we were singing at the top of our lungs during morning praise, evening prayer, and especially during mass. Uh, uh, standing witness to the ancestors of, of black spirituality and black Catholicism, we, we were surrounded by a cloud of witnesses um, and we formed a community we formed a community, which also was essential. Um, and so there was this kind of zipping together of, of two ways of thinking about spirituality. Um, and I was very deeply moved by it. As I said, I got nostalgic just looking at the photos. Uh, and you'll be happy to know that we're engaged in our second effort on this retreat. Um, so this will happen again this year. Um, and our hope is that we can either expand that retreat program within the Midwest province, or if there are other organizations that are interested in replicating this, uh, we would be happy to help share materials and, and build the resources alongside you. So I think that's what I want to say right now. Damien, did I miss anything that you wanted me to talk about? Everything. You said everything and more. Thank you. Oh, Thank good. You so much. Well, um, I'm a talker. Hey, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll introduce um, um, Eric Stiles. Um, Eric, who was a, a spiritual director on this retreat. Um, so who experienced the retreat in a very different way. Um, and so to hear his reflections on that, um, Eric, when, when you're ready. Uh, good afternoon, I, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay. So uh, my name is Eric Stiles, uh, and uh, thank you, Damien, for um, inviting me to speak to you all. I'm a, I've learned that I'm, I'm better when I'm hiding myself, my own screen. Uh, have you ever noticed that? Uh, well, maybe I'm just really conceited because I look at myself way too much. I hide myself. I just look at you. Uh, and uh, and I, I spent uh, seven years in the Society of Jesus uh, from novitiate through uh, the uh, through uh, regency, uh, and which meant that uh, not only did I go on the 30 day retreat as a novice, but I spent uh, a year at Loyola uh, during my studies there at Loyola Chicago, uh, being taught. Uh, spiritual direction. And so uh, after having left the society, I occasionally have found myself offering spiritual direction. Uh, it's not at all a full-time or, or even part-part-time um, responsibility, but it is a part of my life. Um, and I, for most of that time since I left, uh, have often still gone on the eight-day retreat for myself. Uh, but I had not been on the retreat on the eight on an eight day retreat in probably th two or three years um, before this experience. I got a phone call or an email from uh, 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 a Jesuit that I knew 
um, when I was uh, in the society, asking me to participate as a spiritual director, uh, maybe February, it was somewhere around February um, for this retreat, which was in June. And I was in, had returned, recently returned to spiritual direction, receiving spiritual direction, had been a while. Uh, and it was a precarious time. So at first I just let, set, let that email sit uh, and then began to talk. And this was during COVID, of course, right? This is, uh, this is I guess, February of 21. Uh, and talked to my spiritual director about it, talked to others like Joseph Brown, you, you all uh, have seen his picture up. Uh, he was one of the directors, also one of the directors uh, and was a, a, an ongoing consultant with the group. I talked to a friend of mine uh, and I'll, each one of them offered their feedback. Uh, the friend of mine said, uh, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I was the one who sent, sent you to them, sent, <laughs> sent them to you. Uh, so, uh, and you know, finally, uh, made a decision to, to say yes uh, to being a spiritual director. And, uh, uh, and but also decided that I needed to go on retreat because I had been so long since I've been on the eight day retreat. So made plans to go and do the eight day retreat, maybe a full week before this retreat. So, uh, and did my own uh, silent eight day retreat on, on my own. Um, the, the, some of the things that I, I uh, out of the experience. So uh, it was a marathon, uh, a spiritual marathon. It was extraordinary um, being on the retreat. For eight days where so many aspects of the things I think are most formative to my identity were in the room together. As, a, as an African-American person who is, you know, formed in the Ignatian tradition. And so, uh, particularly as an African-American Catholic. And so uh, it was extraordinary. Um, and uh, I would say the things that were really important um, uh, and the guys, Damien and Eric have said, well, you know, this is happenstance, right? I, 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 maybe, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, some of these things were not quite happenstance, you know, uh, because one of the things I think were essential to our success, the spiritual success of the retreat, was the centrality of worship and the quality of music. Um, I have a background in the performing arts. It's always been an important part of my life. And I've always had a clear sense since I've been religious, right, that for the black community and quite frankly, for the wider community that wider, not whiter, a wider community, music is far more essential than we would like um, to, to, uh, to believe. So uh, the quality of the experience, I had never been on an eight day retreat where we sang three times a day or, or, or you know, uh, the, to the quality that we did. Even when I did the 30 day retreat, which is at, uh, I think in, um, was it, uh, uh, where would it have been guys? Uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, we had music at mass every day, which is good music. It was solid. You know, there was a musician who came in and, and, and performed every morning or every after, if there was evening, every evening. Uh, um, but this, and, and it was good. It was solid. Uh, yeah, and it was, but this was more. And um, so much of the meaning of, uh, African American spirituality is carried through music. So having Meyer, I mean, Meyer put together this booklet. Um, and I assume because, you know, we just didn't want to buy, you know, enough hymnals for everybody and, and transport them across the country, right? Or uh, figure out how to do that. Because um, the other option would be to just to, to have the hymnals available, you know, so Lee Me Guide Me Two or Lee Me Guide Me One so that it's all in the same, uh, same place. But this booklet, 79 pages, um, carried us in many ways uh, through the retreat. And uh, it was so significant that we were praying together in the morning and evening and in the afternoon. And so then the other piece of that would be that the spiritual directors were asked to preach regularly. Uh, and for some of us that meant about, so a couple of us, 
it meant about four times over the course of the eight days, really, which, and I'll be honest, the eight days were really kind of nine days, if you really want to count it, <laughs> okay? We started with, we started with mass on day zero uh, in the evening and dinner, and then we, silence began the next day, uh, and then we ended with mass on day nine, I think, right, uh, the, uh, in the morning, and ended with lunch. So, right, like, so, and it was, so the preaching was, the preaching was also a marathon. And uh, since I had never been, I had, I'd, I'd, uh, I had in, in my training had accompanied someone through the 19 meditation, which is the, I think 10 months or so you're doing once a week. I had never done an eight day retreat where I was accompanied. I'd done weekends, but you know, uh, let, uh, uh, directed an eight day retreat. So that's a, you know, I had two directees. Uh, some people had three. Uh, and we decided that three, our advice to them, because we were preaching, that three was enough. Three was the max. Uh, that's what the advice we gave at the end after the retreat. Uh, and so uh, I preached four times, you know, and the preaching was so strong that I, I imagine this, you want to, you, it's not just, you're not competing, but you want to keep up, <laughs> right? Like you don't want the, the, you don't want the rhythm of the retreat to drop, right? Uh, and so uh, the, all of the directors were black. Uh, and uh, uh, the, we did morning and, and after, morning and mass. And then the, uh, the retreat uh, planners and coordinators, right? They did uh, reflections in the afternoon at evening prayer, which was on one of the witnesses. Right, and all but one of them was not black. I mean, it was, was I'm sorry, all of them was white, and uh, and uh, uh, and I mean, Damien, you are are you you're Filipino, aren't you? Yeah, or Latino, Mexican, you're, uh, Mexican, Latino. Mexican, Mexican American, it's Mexican American. I'm sorry, uh, and, and so I just keep saying non-black. No, you got an identity just beyond being not black, right? <laughs> you have your own identity. So I want to say that, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I think that that there was a lot of communal activity throughout the retreat. Uh, and by the end of the day, or even by, by uh, ap the afternoon, I was pooped, I was pooped, right? As a director. So I you know, had morning prayer, we prayed, and then <laughs> I'm doing this on purpose, you know? We had breakfast, and I, had, I, I saw the two directees in the morning before lunch, and then we had mass, uh, and then lunch, and then then I would take, and then we had a meeting, and then I take a nap, uh, <laughs> and kind of try to figure out a way to find some prayer for time for myself uh, through the evening, uh, and to prepare for the next preaching, which was like every other day. Uh, and the things that I found uh, um, important to also say that each of the, because the a day was long enough, I had one person who was. Uh, a young adult, I would call a young adult black person. He was probably in his early, late twenties, early thirties. And then a middle-aged white Jesuit priest uh, who I actually knew beforehand as the directees. And they each were on their own retreat, right? So like the graces of the retreat were named, but it wasn't as if we were expecting that the person who was on the retreat, particularly for instance, an eight day, was going to be stay in that place. The, the attempt was to respond to his or her needs as they were and not presume. Uh, so we were on a retreat. We weren't on a program, if that makes any sense. Right? This was not, as they pointed out, an educational program. Uh, this was not a workshop uh, to teach people how to be anti racist. Right? This was a retreat that was infused with black identity and black experience um, and the challenges that we face as a country. But it was God and your relationship to God was central. And I'm not saying that the workshops aren't important. I think that they are important. But I have found myself desiring to see us have a spirituality of anti-racism that's not just doesn't look just like uh, what secular society is doing. Um, that is rooted in, um, uh, quite frankly, in Jesus. 
Hmm. And begins and ends and in the middle is Jesus, right? And so that, that was really important to me. Uh, and so the retreatants, they, they gave, the, they, you know, their conversation led to each of us in whatever direction we're going. And we would just check in as a group and say, here's how this is going in general, in generalities about how the retreats are doing and how we're feeling. Uh, but um, just being in the room with, with that many people who understood something too about black spirituality and English spirituality at the same time, as well as uh, we're African American Catholics along with our brothers and sisters who are from, uh, who are not African American, right? Together was just, uh, a very unique experience for me as a director, as a, as a, as a, as a Christian. And I, I think what I hope for is that this pro process, this project continues um, and that, you know, you know, do it again, you know, don't, don't try and fix it. Don't try to, you know, just do it again and see what happens, right? Um, the AD, I, unfortunately, because of the time it's gonna be in August, I won't be able to because of my, my work. But uh, uh, I, I think that, what would I say? I, I, I would just say that it, it's a real opportunity to, to develop uh, the subtle spiritual skills of paying attention that maybe Ignatius tries to get us to do, right? To, to, to pay attention to that. So I don't know if, it, uh, we, uh, I'll, I'll be quiet so we can have some questions. Thank you, Eric. I think that was very beautiful. That was that was lovely. Um, yeah, as as Eric said, we we um, we are open for questions. So if anybody would would have questions, that's our presentation. Um, and I, I maybe there's a lot of questions. Um, maybe as the dust settles, you'll you'll have more. I know I don't know if she's here, but I spoke with with someone earlier, maybe like a couple of weeks ago, about about this kind of on a one on one. And so no. Um, if, if they wanted to get in touch with Aaron and uh, they can, we can, I can also, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about this after you sit with it, you know. Um, but uh, if you have any questions now for myself, the Eric's, <laughs> um, uh, let, let me know, let me know. There's a question in the chat about resource recommendations. Um, and, and one thing that I would recommend is that, uh, and I'm just looking on my bookshelf. Also, sorry, you can see my messy room here. Um, it's a book by Joseph Brown. I'm just going to find it real quick. Oh, man. Where is it at? Maybe it, is it to stand on the rock? No, no. It's um, it's called or the liturgies. Retreat. It's called a retreat with Thea Bowman. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gideon Abraham leaning on the Lord. So Joseph Brown wrote a text um, that is in and of itself a retreat. It's the kind of thing that I think Joseph expected people to be able to do on their own. Um, so if you want to get a sense of of how this kind of music and dialogue can can come together in a spirit of Black Catholicism, uh, this would be an excellent book. Um, and really anything by Joseph Brown, but this one in particular, if you're looking for something that, that is designed like a retreat. So that's one thing I can offer as far as a resource. He's someone's been mentioning that it's now out of print, unfortunately. Um, but don't let that stop you if you if if find a way. <laughs> Don't let that stop you. It, it, you know. I would say another other another resource other um, for the films that we selected. Um, uh, it was a lot of googling, a lot of YouTubing. Um, I, we can, uh, we can provide, I, I should have like wrote down the list of the films that we had, that we had used. Um, so I could easily, easily, um, access them for everyone. Um, but, uh, one of the documentaries that we saw at the beginning was a documentary called the songs are free. 
Um, it is kind of a it is a it is a, a hard film to to get a hold of, um, but it was um, the songs are free. Bernice Johnson, Regan, and, and African American music. It was the first documentary that we watched the, the on day zero um, that spoke about the importance of black sacred music and spirit and, and, and black spirituals um, to black spirituality. Um, and I learned a lot from that one documentary to help me understand how music plays a role in 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 in, in black spirituality, faith, um, and also in my own life uh, as well. Um, so that's a really good resource if you're able to to get a hold of it. There's another question: When and where and when is this year's retreat? This year's retreat um, is, let me pull it up, is in August, August 3rd through the 12th. And it is at the William J. Kelly Retreat Center at St. Augustine Seminary in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Um, I can also send out in, in some information. Erin, am I able to send things to you and you can like blast it out, is that a thing? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll send out the recording from today, um, hopefully early next week. So any resources or things that you'd want to include, I can send all in one email. Great. Yes, we, we, we have a, we're, we're getting in, in uh, we have an interest form for those who'd be interested in, in attending um, that retreat, or at least just that'll add you to a mailing list, at least for the future retreats, if not able, if you're not able to do it this year. And I'll just say something about uh, the location of the retreat this year. Last year we were scrambling, so we just <laughs> we just did it at a retreat center that we could find, and so it was at the Loyola. And it was University. COVID, and it was COVID too. And it was COVID, right? So it was the Loyola University Retreat and Ecology Campus last year, uh, but this year the location in Bay St. Louis it's now a retreat center, but it is the historical location of the first black Catholic seminary in the United States. And so what we've added is a consideration of, of the geography and the history of that geography. Um, and so it's gonna be a cool experience to be down there, to be in one of the sort of original, original locations of great importance in the black Catholic church and especially as it pertains to black Catholic clergy, so. There was another question about the witnesses. Um, the witnesses were, let's see, uh, Sister Thea Bowman, Augustus Tolton, the first Black Catholic, um, the, the first African American priest uh, ordained in the United States, Sister Antona Ebo, who spoke before the march in Selma, um, Amelia Boynton, who herself was injured during the march in Selma. We spent some time with James Baldwin with Brian, Emmett Tills, Emmett sorry. Tills Brian Mother, Stevenson, yeah. and then um, did I miss anybody? I just dropped some of, I dropped their names in our chat. So we have, yes, Sister Thea Bowman, Brian Stevenson, Sister Mary Antonia Ebo, Father Augustus Tolton, James Baldwin, Mamie Till, Mobley and Emmett Till, Amelia Mobley Robinson, and Maya Angelou. You know, and one of the things we're talking about for content is, um, is growing growing our resources around those clouds of that cloud of witnesses. So Maya Angelou was a great gift to us last year. And in the spirit of, and in the importance of recognizing black literary traditions and black spirituality, Toni Morrison herself is a black Catholic. And so we're gonna try and I think integrate her as well into our work. Um, and so there's some room for us to grow and continue our creative efforts to, to increase our understanding of and our, and our witnessing this cloud, so. I, I got to just add one more thing, and I'm going to probably need to go soon too, but uh, just uh, wanted to say uh, how to ratify and encourage um, what Damien said about the centrality of the Eucharist to our experience together. Um, and this presents a complicated challenge because um, you may be in environments where the, so many African Americans that you live and work with are not Catholic. Um, but the reality is, is that we 
African American Catholics are here. Um, and the, I just want to say that the, that the Eucharist matters. Um, and um, I, I think the solidarity of being present to one another at the Eucharist um, and seeing it as the beginning um, of solidarity in many ways, um, so that it might be, it might fuel work with people who may or may not be, right? Like, like it, it as a place to begin where we come to the table of the Lord as equals. Um, and uh, there are, and I just thought that, I don't know why, I just wanted to say that because I think that I, I probably, I'm saying that because I think I probably am worried about, um, quite frankly, wa a watered down version that isn't Eucharistic. Uh, and uh, yeah, quite frankly, I, there was a time for ecumenical prayer there's, that's absolutely important, but it, it should not be at the expense of Catholic Christians across ethnic backgrounds embracing their Catholicism uh, and embracing Black Catholicism. Um, uh, yeah, and allowing Black Catholicism to shape us and this retreat. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, there's also, I also want to, I don't know, Eric, if you know that there's a question here for you, Eric Immel. I believe that's Janine. Janine? Janine Francis, is that you? <laughs> um, um, about your remarks about spirituality of anti racism. And um, if, you, if you had, if she would like to hear more about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to share more. But I got to think for a second. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, I, I hope this isn't a, I hope this doesn't feel like a redirection, but a book just came out. Uh, it's written by a white Catholic ethicist who teaches in Philadelphia at LaSalle University. Her name is Maureen O'Connell, um, and she's writing to a white audience. It's called Undoing the Knots. Five Generations of American Catholic Anti-Blackness. And what she's doing is tracing in her own life and in her own history, the ways in which her family as a traditional Irish Catholic family participated in anti-Black racism throughout its history. And so I've just, I've just read this book for the first time, but it resonated deeply with me because it, it helped give name to some of the work that I think I and a lot of especially white Catholics are trying to do toward building a church that is anti-racist. And her basic proposal is that racial mercy has to be the defining pursuit of Catholicism in America today. Um, and so, you know, that work for me has been Number one, um, do, doing doing that kind of reading and that kind of study on my own. Um, number two, um, in Boston here especially, um, entering very carefully and slowly into Black Catholic communities of worship. Um, so so not presuming anything and and becoming a member of that parish community. Um, I now work as a deacon in that parish community um, and just just having a sense of the experience of people who identify as both Black and Catholic experience, especially in, in Black Christian ethics, womanist ethics, um, is, is central to the way that we move forward together. Um, uh, and then I think also just embracing the reality that, you know, a certain part of the secular world is, is also strategizing what anti-racism looks like in our institutions, in our, in our society as a whole. So, um, and what that's done for me is, what that's done for me is just infuse itself and graft itself onto my own Catholic identity. Um, so I, I think it's probably, at least in my world, just standing witness to this movement in our time, um, to be honest, to be vulnerable, um, to meet, to read, 
Gina, I don't know if that answers your question, but. <laughs> I think that's, that's what we have. Excellent. Thank you all. Thanks, Damian. Thanks both Eric, Eric Styles, Eric and Will for being here for sharing your reflections and your work. Um, I hope for those of you joining us at you know, provide some insights and perhaps I think folks are always looking for tangible um, ways to continue this work in their own community. So I hope that that um, can happen here as well. I have a few announcements. I'm gonna share some ISN updates um, before you all go. The first is that you likely know Lent starts next week. We have two Lenten series happening here um, out of our office. The first is um, our annual daily Lenten series. Um, and I can share a link to that. And then the second is um, tied to the Laudato Si action platform. So if you, or perhaps a school or parish community that you're working or participating as a part of um, are working within the Laudato Si action platform model, um, there are weekly Lenten updates um, that's happening with the series there as well. So I'll share both those links. Um, the third piece is that the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice, which is ISN's annual social justice conference that takes place each year, each fall, um, in Washington, D.C., is scheduled for October 22nd through the 24th, 2022, um, and we'll be opening registration for that um, in mid-March. So if that's something that you or your parish community is interested in, we'd be really happy to have you. Um, if you have any questions about it, feel free to be in touch with me. The other promo piece I'll give for the teaching is that we'll also be opening speaker applications um, in mid-March. So um, if you are doing work in your parish um, or in your community um, and want to share that, I would invite you to, to submit an application. I do hope that the teaching can be a place where groups like this um, of parishioners working across the country maybe um, on similar projects in different contexts can come together and network in person. Like I said, we've been, some of us have been meeting together via Zoom for about a year and a half. So um, I would just advocate that the teaching is a great opportunity um, to come together in person. Um, and I will share that link. And then that's all I have for you all today. Um, thanks again for joining us. And like I said, I will share out this recording probably early next week. Take care. All. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.